four. <clears throat> Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up, talking about us Christians, grow up into him, into Jesus in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, Lord, we do thank you for your goodness. Lord, we just thank you we're saved. Thank you we can be in the house of God tonight. We just pray for those who are not here. We don't know about all of them, why, traveling, sick, or whatever. We undertake, meet those needs, be back with us on Wednesday night. And Lord, as we look into your scriptures tonight, pray you speak to our hearts, and especially young adults and teenagers. In Jesus' name, amen. He says we're to grow up into him in all things. Just going to give you seven short principles here tonight. Aim mainly at young adults and uh, teenagers, um, but as you know, principles fit all of us. That we find from the Word of God, but some things that ought to be done when a, a young person grows up and get out on their own and so on, and um, so that uh, God doesn't lose them out of His church. We've seen too many people grow up and just float off into La La Land when they get grown, quit going to church, quit serving God, and all that. And uh, so, if you don't make your mind up now, young people, you you might wind up doing that. Make your mind up. So let me just give you these principles real quick. We'll look at some scriptures. Look at Proverbs chapter 2. <clears throat> Proverbs 2. Let me say, number one, don't forsake your upbringing. Do not forsake your upbringing. All you kids are growing up in church. I didn't have that privilege. Some of your parents didn't have that privilege. Uh, and you don't even look at it as a privilege, but it is. It really is. What a blessing. You get to grow up in a Christian home and grow up in church. And so, like I said, never, never had that... Uh, a privilege at all. My parents never set foot into church as far as I know. I was 13 years old, and that lasted a few months, and we moved somewhere else, and they never started back to church. So all my growing up was uh, church-wise was very limited. Thus, so I went and visited some of my cousins that went to church, and I go with them, but uh, I didn't grow up in church. And <clears throat> so, like I said, some of your parents didn't, and so you got a privilege that your parents did not have, okay? Don't forsake your upbringing. Proverbs 2, verse 17. <clears throat> which forsaketh, and he's talking about a particular person in the passage, but I mean everybody uh, when they grow up, which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. Well, she must have been in that covenant, must have had that covenant, must have had, uh, when she was growing up, guides that were aiming her in the right direction, but God said when she got grown, she forsook all that and turned and went uh, the other direction. And so you young people need to remember the guides of your youth. Say, so who would that be? Well, first and foremost, be your parents. That's the first guide you ever had when you came into this world. And then uh, later on, a, a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or, you know, other people try to help direct your life and so forth. And uh, he's warning you not to forsake the guides of your youth. People, when you were growing up, that gave you principles to live by. My dad didn't get saved until I was a teenager. And, uh, but he, had, he, he instilled in me some principles that later on I realized were out of this book, Godly Principles, even though he wasn't saved. Why? Because he's a man of character. Okay? He has good character. And he instilled some of that in me. You can't see much of it, I know, but he instilled some of that in me. Anyway, <clears throat> and later on I saw those same principles in the Word of God. And so uh, the people that have been instrumental in your life, young people, uh, don't forget that when you grow up. I don't mean instrumental in a positive way. Amy, you toward the Lord. Amy, you toward uh, doing right and having good character and so on like that. And so don't forsake those people of what they've taught you. Don't forsake your heritage. Don't forsake your upbringing. Uh, if you've got parents who love God, and uh, hopefully everybody, every young person in this church has parents who love God. I hope all the parents in this church love the Lord. And if you've got those kind and they're faithful to the Lord, don't turn your back on that upbringing when you grow up. Amen. When you get out on your own, don't turn your back on, on uh, those kind of things. And a church family that loves you, and I'll guarantee you, everybody's church loves all kids. Amen. Uh, say, well, they, they uh, tell me to behave. Well, that's because they love you, all right? Wouldn't let you be hellions if they, they would let you be hellions if they didn't love you. And so uh, your church family loves you, and God wants the best out of your life. And he wants, uh, he wants to bless you tremendously, but you've got to stay with him uh, for him to be able to do that. And so don't turn your back on the things you've been taught, whether from a pulpit or a lectern in a Sunday school room or in the, in the living room in your house.
promise you, Mom and Dad talk to you, don't forsake that stuff. Amen. Uh, it'll be detrimental to you if you do. So number one, don't forsake your upbringing. <clears throat> number two, look at Ecclesiastes 11, right after Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Point number two, remember that you will give an account of your life to the Lord. One day you will stand before Him. Uh, it's interesting about not just young people, but everybody. Nobody ever thinks they're going to die. I don't care if they're 19 or 99. You know, they act like they're going to live forever. But none of us are. And people do die at all ages. All ages. Yeah. From infancy on to 100 years old or whatever. And so one day you will stand before God. It might look, like, look a far off right now, but it's going to happen one day. And you're going to give account to the Lord for your life during that uh, time frame. And so you need to remember that. That will help you stay right with the Lord. Uh, chapter 11, verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. Well, rejoice in your youth. Somebody said if you could ever get the, the, the vim and vitality of youth and the wisdom of old age together, you'd have some, some really good. Amen. doesn't happen that way, though. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. Now, he's being negative. It doesn't seem like that at first, but you'll see by what else he says. Let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eye. But when you're doing that, know thou that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. So, young person, go ahead and follow your heart. Go ahead and follow your eyes. And if they're leading you astray and you follow that, then you're going to answer to God for that. So, yeah, hopefully you've got your eyes on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2 says. And so, hopefully you keep your eyes on him, uh, on the finish line. Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and keep your sights in the right direction and keep your heart right with the Lord. Uh, stay right with Him. Uh, if you follow your fleshly heart, your carnal heart, you're going to get in trouble. And you will answer to God for that. Let's read on here. <clears throat> he said, No, for, for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. Verse 10. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Childhood and youth are vanity. That's why Paul says when you grow up, put away what? Childish things. Oh, what is that? Romans 13. When you grow up, put away childish things, okay? There's, there comes a time in life to put the bottle down, all right? You're not an infant anymore. There comes a time in life to put the tricycle down. There comes a time in life to put the bicycle down. There comes a time in, time in life to put all the games aside and live the way God wants you to live. It's called maturity. Okay? It's called growing up. That doesn't mean you can't have fun in life. I, I believe Christians are the ones who have a real right to have fun in life. Amen. Because we're the ones who have real life. I'm coming they might have life and have it more abundant, the Lord said. Okay. So you ought to have abundant life. If you love the Lord, you're going you're gonna to love living for Him. You're going to love serving Him. You're going to love fellowship with the saints. All those kind of things that, that we do that the world cannot do. And so uh, you're going to realize childhood and vanity are childhood and, and youth are vanity. And put away the childish things and start living for the Lord. Keep reading here. Chapter 12, verse 1 is the next verse. <clears throat> he says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come out. What evil days? Huh? Days of old age, days of bad health, days of all those kind of things. He spends all of chapter 12 talking about uh, your body falling apart when you get old. <laughs> and it does. You realize most old people have AIDS. They have hearing AIDS. They have seeing AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> walking aids, <laughs> all kind of aids to keep them going along. Amen. So uh, remember, remember your Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not. In other words, serve the Lord while you are, while you got the vitality to do so. And when you're old, you'll still be loving the Lord, still be living for the Lord. When the evil days come not, now the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Okay, the good old days. Sarah, Sarah, I talk about the good old days all the time. So uh, you need to remember that whatever you do in life, you're going to give an account to God for that. It's going to be a blow-by-blow blow account of everything that was not put under the blood along this trip. Amen. 1 John, 1 John 1, 9. Confess it. And whatever you did wrong, and God will forgive it and cleanse you, and then you go on for the glory of God. But those things that are not confessed and put under the blood, that you'll give an account for uh, to the Lord one of these days. 
And let's be honest, we get caught up in the moment of carnality and worldliness and fleshliness. A lot of times we don't confess whatever we did during those times. Just don't confess to be right with God. Some people go backslide on God and they'll stay away for years before they decide they better get back right with God. What about all that stuff that happened in those years? They can't even remember most of it. So you will give an account to the Lord one day. And if you keep that in the back of your mind, it will help keep you going in the right direction. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4. <clears throat> so, don't forsake your upbringing. Remember, you'll give an account for your life to the Lord. Number three, keep your testimony pure. 1 Timothy 4, keep your testimony pure. That Your testimony is all you've got before this world to represent the Lord and your relationship to Him. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. He says, let no man despise thy youth. Well, why would, why would somebody despise your youth? Because you act like a fool, that's why. You act the way you're supposed to, do like you're supposed to do. Nobody despises your youth. So he says, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believer uh, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. He says, you're to be an example of what a real Christian is, an example of the believers, young people. Now let's, look, let's break this verse down. He says, be that example of the believers, first of all, in word. Now, Jesus said you'll give account for every idle word that you've spoken. That's in Matthew 12. I forget the verse, 37 or somewhere in there. You'll give an account for every idle word which you've spoken. How many idle words do we speak every day? I mean, every day. If we could, if we could uh, take inventory of all our words from the moment we wake up and we go to sleep at night, and I don't know who ever counted, but somebody says the average person speaks 20 to 25,000 words a day, maybe so, I don't know. At a normal speaking speed, you speak about 150 words a minute. And so uh, if you could give a, a categorize those words, what percentage of what you spoke all day long is just hot air? It's just vanity. It just amounts to nothing. Nothing. My wife and I went out to lunch today. And by the way, Dana, I had to eat rice. You predicted that in Sunday school. Now, don't say that again because that's what it winds up doing. We went to the Thai restaurant and, well, they got rice. I mean. <laughs> but anyway, where am I at? Okay, every idle word. And they got, I don't know why the world restaurants have TVs hanging everywhere. That's so stupid, but they do. And people sit around and watch TV, and if they're not watching TV, they're playing with their cell phone, and, they, and there's no conversation going on between people anymore. Nobody knows how to talk to each other. So they sit across the table and text each other. <laughs> anyway, what was it? Fox News was on. I can't think of the character's name. Some of y'all know everybody on there. You don't know the 12 apostles, but you know everybody on Fox News. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> or, or you like Brother Webster, you know everybody in the NFL. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and this guy's on there, and he's interviewing somebody. And I tell my wife, I said, you know what? Those characters make millions of dollars a year just to sit there and express their opinion. And that's all it is. It's their opinion. Well, what do you think about this? Well, if we do this, that's all it is. 24 hours a day. You talk about idle words. You give account for every idle word, young person. You're going to answer to God for everything that comes out of your mouth. And if it's wrong, you better get it right with God or you'll give account for it. Amen. And I'm not saying it's wrong to joke and horse around, stuff like that. The Bible doesn't say anything wrong with that unless the joking is risque. Okay, <laughs> not, not be doing that. Uh, fools make a mock of sin. You know, jokes about drunks and all that kind of stuff. Fools make a mock of sin. So every word, be an example of the believers. And he says, be an example of the believers in conversation. Now, young people, that doesn't mean your speech. In the Bible, that word means your whole life. Every facet of your life is your conversation. Your conversation is you. That is your life. So every area of life, you'll give an account for every area of your life, your home life, your family life, your job life, okay? Everything, your career, your ministry. That's why a young person growing up, a Christian Young person growing up in church and all that, you ought not to say, I said, what you want to be when you grow up? You ought not to say this or that. You ought to say, whatever God wants. Amen. That's all that matters in life. What does God want? Amen. Amen. Oh, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a lawyer. Be whatever you want to be, but you better want to be what God wants you to be. Amen. Uh, or you'll give an account for your conversation. And then he says, be an example in charity. Okay, compassion, kindness. 
forgiving spirit. Uh, each Christian ought to be an example of how to forgive others. Amen. Even as Christ, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you, we're supposed to forgive other people. Jesus said, if your brother offends you seven times a day and comes and says, I repent, you forgive him seven times a day. Amen. Whatever it takes. We ought to be an example of that, young people. Don't get mad when you don't like what your friend did or your peer did. Forgive. And it'll make all the difference in your life and um, your character and so on. Then he says, be an example uh, of the believers in, in uh, spirit. He's talking about attitude there. What kind of spirit? He, uh, Jesus asked James and John, they, they got upset at some uh, people who wouldn't do what Jesus wanted done. He said, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven like Elijah did and burn them? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. You don't know what kind of attitude you're expressing there. The Lord told him he came to save life, not to, not to destroy it. And so uh, be an example of the believer in spirit. Have a godly attitude in every situation. You don't uh, like what somebody's saying to you or somebody's, you know, what they're doing to you. Have a, have a godly attitude about it. Well, how did Jesus react? He said, uh, 1 Peter 2, 23, 24, 25, along there, he says, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. Uh, he, just, he just didn't retaliate. And thank God he didn't. He destroyed the whole planet if he had retaliated on what they were doing to him. And so God, the attitude, having the right spirit, is just learning how to take it. That's called growing up. You parents who run to your kids rescue every time something goes haywire in their life, you're doing you're making a bad mistake. They're not learning how to take it. They're not learning how to roll with the punches, so to speak. Amen. Let them skin their knee, man. Let them do whatever. A boy comes in with a black eye. Uh, don't chew him out, Dad. Say, did you give him one? <laughs> Amen. Let him grow up. Amen. Toughen him up. Yeah. Why? They're going to face a lot of stuff in this world. Amen. Your kids are going to face a whole lot more grief and heartache than you have faced. Because this world, Jesus said, seducers are waxing worse and worse. Getting worse by the day. Sin is rampant. Shall the Son of Man find faith in the earth when he comes? Probably not. In fact, I read a thing about Minnesota a couple days ago. And it said uh, they did a poll of, uh, of uh, denominations, who's, who's who in denominations in their state, and said the fastest growing denomination in the state of Minnesota is none. People rejecting church, people staying out of church, people not getting involved in in religion, so to speak, and so on. And that's that's not just going to be Minnesota. That's going to be everywhere. It's going to be everywhere. In fact, I read a statistic a long time ago about uh, England. Less than 2% of English people go to church. Less than 2%. And you see uh, cathedrals and stuff being turned into warehouses and all that kind of business today. We saw a, a, a business a couple days ago. And I, I forgot what it was. And I told my wife, I said, that's a church building. Church building turned into some sort of a business. There's one in, in Crestview, an electrical company, and been in that church building for years and years. So what's wrong with that? Plenty's wrong with that. Churches closing their doors, and Christian people quit going to church, stuff like that. Just like the Lord predicted. The apostasy falling away in the last days. So be an example in uh, spirit. The Bible says David behaved himself wisely when he was promoted, and he behaved himself wisely when he's demoted. King Saul made him a uh, captain, which would be a general, over all his army, and he behaved himself wisely, and uh, Saul got afraid of him, demoted him from being over the whole army, put him as a captain over a thousand men, and he still behaved himself wisely. So he behaved himself wisely, no matter what the situation is going on. The Bible talks about the will to have that which becometh godliness. Our attitude ought to be what? Becometh Amen. godliness. Then he says, be, a, be an example <clears throat> of the believers in faith. Now what would that be? Always believe in the Lord. Always staying uh, right with Him. Staying faithful to Him. Uh, I'll tell you, it does something to lost people. When they see a Christian going through a tragedy and they're hanging on to their sanity and they're hanging on to their faith in the Lord and they're trusting in the Lord to get them through this situation, it, it makes an impression on lost people. It really does. And some of you guys on the job, you've experienced 
uh, lost people who they didn't want to get saved, didn't want you witnesses to them. But when trouble hits, you're the first person they come to who wants some help and some guidance and some counsel because they've seen you go through it and seen you be able to handle it. So they know you've got something that they don't have. Amen. So in, uh, in faith, then he says, be an example of the believers in purity. What is that? Staying morally above reproach. Not doing anything that somebody can point a finger at you. You call yourself a Christian. You do that. Don't, uh, don't uh, give them reason for that. You need to maintain a godly testimony in public and in private. In the workplace, in, in the marketplace, wherever you're at. Uh, and maintain a good testimony. When I said in private, also, your real character is what you are when nobody else is around. So what you think, what you act, what you're planning, what's in your heart, all that stuff, but nobody is around. But let me clue you in on something, young people. God's always around. And He knows what's in our heart. Amen. He knows what we think. So, an example in purity. Oh, well, that's all six of them that are in there. First Timothy 3 7 says, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, I know who's talking about that passage, but you can apply that to any Christian. We need to have a good report of them that are without. That's the world. That's the lost, okay? They ought, to, they ought to have a respect for you out there in the community because of your Christian testimony. Them that are without, lest you fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Philippians 2.15 says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And, uh, of course, he's, Paul's talking about talking over there in Rome and uh, to the Roman Empire and all that stuff, perverse nation. But we live in a crooked, perverse nation. Amen. 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 We do. I mean, it's about as crooked as a snake. Uh, I saw a painting the other day. You know the picture of George Washington on the boat crossing the Potomac and all that stuff? Y'all seen that picture? Okay, this had Trump in standing up in the boat, and he had a lantern and guys around with shotguns and oars knocking at, at, at uh, crocodiles and stuff. And in the background was a white house. Oh, I said, what's that about? I said, it's about the fact they call Washington, D.C. the swamp now. He's dealing with the critters in the swamp. <laughs> Amen. You live in a crooked, perverse nation. You're supposed to shine as lights. And as they say, the darker the night, the brighter the light. Amen. Psalm 101, verse 2. Here's a decision made by the psalmist, and I challenge every young person in here, every, everybody here, make this decision if you haven't made it. He said, I will. Here's what I'm going to do. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. What's my house? What's my body? Okay. I'll walk within it with a perfect heart. I'll behave myself wisely. You need to learn, young person, to behave yourself wisely wherever you're at. Whoever you're around, behave yourself wisely. Alright, let's go to Romans 16, principle number 4. Romans chapter 16. And this is, don't try to learn the ways of the world. Do not try to learn the ways of the world. You don't even know it. It'll just get you in trouble with God, in trouble with your future, in trouble with your family, in trouble with the job, in trouble, whatever. Amen. Don't try to learn the ways of the world. Romans 16 verse 19. <clears throat> For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. What did you say? Everybody knows you have a good testimony. That's what he's saying Amen. to these folks. He's right to you. Everybody knows you've got a good testimony. Your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I'm glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. So if you've got a great testimony, everybody knows your testimony, everybody knows how much you love the Lord, how much you try to serve God and all that, you've got such a good testimony, but you need to remember that you need to stay wise to that which is good, things of God, and simple concerning people. You know, people, you don't need to know what all goes on in that world. You just don't need to know. <clears throat> it is a vile, wicked place. You just don't need to know. Amen. All we need to know about sin is what, what's revealed in that book. And God tells us enough to know that it's a, He talks about you, you, know, you, lean, you lean against the hedge and the serpent will come out and bite you. Well, what's the serpent? That's the devil. Amen. So uh, just uh, don't, don't try to learn everything that's out there. You couldn't anyway. It was too much. But uh, you don't need to learn wicked stuff. You just need to be aware that uh, those are things people ought to be doing against me in hell. 
Those are the things that got Jesus crucified. Why would a Christian want to be involved in it? Just your, your knowledge should be that it exists, and that's as far as it goes. You don't need to test, test it out. You don't need to experiment with it. You don't need to know what alcohol tastes like. You don't need to know what it's like to smoke a cigarette. You don't need to know any of that stuff. Amen. But a lot of Christians get into that. You don't need to take dope and uh, have a high and all that kind of stuff. You live right with God. You have all the high you can handle. Amen. In the Lord. Look over at, uh, let's see, look at 1 John chapter 3. Don't try to run the ways of the world. 1 John, I'm, talking, I'm sorry, not 1 John, 3 John. 3 John. <clears throat> There's three men mentioned in 3 John. Two of them are good guys, one's a bad guy, so we're not fooling with the bad guy, but I'm going to show you what it says about the good guy. Verse 1 of 3 John. The elder unto the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the Lord, are in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. He said, your soul, you're saved, you love God, you're living for God. I hope your physical health is just that good. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came, and notice this, he says, I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee. This guy has a good testimony from people. Even as thou walkest in truth. And he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So John had led this guy, Gaius, to the Lord. And now he gets testimony from other people that, uh, that Gaius is living the life he ought to. Testify the truth that's in thee. And thou walkest in truth. And he said, that thrills my soul. I have no greater joy. And parents have no greater joy if they're right with God than to know that their children are walking in truth. Amen. What a blessing when your kids grow up and they're serving God. Yeah. What a blessing that is. Now look down at verse 12. That other guy in here, Demetrius, <clears throat> hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. Even the truth speaks highly of him. Yea, and we also, we also bear record. And you know that our record is true. So the first man in here, he says, the brethren came and told me what a great testimony you have. And the second guy, he said, everybody, even the lost people, tell me what a great testimony you've got in the town. Everybody, everybody respects you. Everybody looks up to you. That's what you ought to strive for, young people. Have a testimony that's above reproach. Don't give them anything to throw rocks at. Find fault with you. Now, if you've got real enemies out there, you will, if you live for the Lord long enough, you'll have enemies, and they'll create the rocks. They'll lie about you and stuff like that, so that stuff's going to happen. But make sure, in fact, Peter talks about that. If they tell something on you, uh, something bad, make sure it's a lie and not something you're guilty of. Amen. So try uh, to not to learn the ways of the world. Now, you'll go a long way in fulfilling that principle, uh, by knowing who to stay away from. Learn what separation is all about. And if there's another young person, one of your peers want you to do something that you know your parents wouldn't approve of, your church wouldn't approve of, that God wouldn't approve of, just tell them no. And uh, if they persist in that, stay away from that person. Just stay away from them. I had a preacher tell me one time about an evangelist who, who uh, Told, told this preacher's boy, his son, he ought to divorce his wife. And I said, well, you ought not to have that guy in your church anymore, giving a, a counsel like that. That's crazy, telling somebody to divorce their spouse. And so, um, and I realize there's reasons in the Bible. I understand all that, okay? But you don't go around telling, you ought to divorce them, stuff like that. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, that's between them and God about that kind of stuff. But have a, another preacher come in and tell someone, you're going to divorce your, your, your spouse. Uh, so be careful who you listen to, people. Young people, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, don't try to learn the ways of the world. And if you listen to the wrong people, that's what you're going to learn. Amen. 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 They're going to be trying to get you to do things you ought not be doing. And if you're not uh, strong, you'll do it. What are they leading you to do? Well, let's look at another one. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. This is number 5. We don't have any left here. Number 5. 2 Peter chapter 3. And uh, this principle is never lower your standards. Never lower your standards. In fact, you ought to keep raising it. Keep raising your standards. <clears throat> when, I, uh, when I got saved, I already had some standards in my life. I'll tell you, my daddy instilled some things in me. I already had some standards. And guess what? 50 something years later, I still got those standards. But. I've got a lot of other standards. As I've learned the Word of God, learned things God didn't want us to do or want us to do, then those get added 
to those standards. You want to please the Lord. You want to do what He wants and so forth. So you learn other things and you, you uh, keep raising your standards. That's what you're doing. 2 Peter 3, verse 17. He says, uh, verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things be before, you already know about this, beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. I'm talking about maintaining your standards and, and continue to raise those standards. He said, if you're not careful, the people you hang around are going to lead you astray, the error of the wicked, and you're going to fall from your own steadfastness. You're going to back up from where you are now. And uh, us older folks, we, we could name you Christians, I don't doubt they say, but now they drink, okay? Now they smoke, now they run around with a spouse, now they don't go to church, now they live like the devil. Uh, after being in church for years and years and serving the Lord. Amen. Some of them even had ministries for God and now they don't have anything for God. They're living uh, after the flesh completely. And that, what happened? This right here is what happened. Let away with the air of the wicked and fall from your own steadfastness. So maintain your standards and continue to raise your standards as you find more and more in the Word of God how God wants you to live and don't ever lower those standards. Let's read on here. Verse 18. He says, uh, don't, don't get carried away with the of the wicked. Don't fall from your steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And be glory for both now and ever and forever. Amen. So continue to grow in the things of the Lord. More and more Christ-like is what we're supposed to be doing. Now, from 2, Peter, 2, Timothy chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse, verse 17, he talks about uh, uh, developing into the same image. Image of Christ, okay. growing up into, into Jesus like we ought to be. All right, let's look at 2 Timothy 2 again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and notice uh, number 6. 2 Timothy 2, always follow what the Bible says. Okay. The Bible must be your final Amen. authority in life. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Somebody wants you to do something, go somewhere and do it. What does the Bible say about that? You know, years ago, back in the 70s and 80s, they had to, you know, people wear little bracelets, all kind of stuff. Oh, WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's what that was supposed to mean. What would Jesus do? Uh, I noticed some that wore that, and they were doing what Jesus wouldn't have done, but <laughs> still, still had it on. Well, what would he do? What would Jesus do in a situation like this? We're to follow his steps, right? Hey. Amen. So always do what the Bible says. Uh, chapter 2, verse 15. Here's what it says, study, command, study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you study the Bible, see what it says, you do what it says. You're following what the Bible says. Verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word, the word of profane babblers, their word will eat as doth a canker, a cancer, okay, eat away, destroy you. Of whom is Hominius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. And it goes on to end that verse says, they overthrow the faith of some. They've departed from the faith. Now those two men, professing Christians, uh, uh, they were, and it's not told here, but first Timothy tells, they were teaching the resurrection past already, which the only way you can teach that is if it was a spiritual resurrection to the literal, to the physical, like the Bible teaches. And so they overthrow the faith of some. So he says, you study this book, whatever anybody teaches, whatever Hymenian has taught you, you go back and see if the Bible says that. And if it does, okay. And if it doesn't, then ignore what that guy said and follow what the Scriptures say. The Bible's got to be our final authority. Thus saith the Lord. Isn't that the way Jesus refuted Satan over and over? It is written. It is written. It is written. And that's uh, and so he, that's how he fought against every temptation the devil threw at him. Israel. Oh, the Bible says, no, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. And you get called names, you know, Holy Roller and Bible Thumper and whatever other nonsense they come up with. But you just stay with that book. It's the only thing. The Word of God is the only thing 100% correct on this planet. The only thing. No person is, no book is, except this one. Okay. Uh, I've heard Christians say things like, well, what was it? It was... Uh, the rich man of Larry, Lazarus, Luke 16. Even some of the commentaries call that a parable. It's not a parable. It's a real situation in life that God was, Jesus was doing an illustration about. Okay? 
And I had a man tell me one time, he said, that's a parable. I said, no, it's not a parable. It's talking about real people. He said, I know it's a parable because I read it in the book. Duh! Okay. Wrong book. This is the final authority. Amen. This book is the final authority. And young people, you've got to get that ingrained in your soul. No matter what happens in life, I'm going to go by the Word of God. Amen. We had a couple in this church one time, family, and the husband and wife was having a little squabble. But some husbands and wives do that, right, guys? Some of them do that. I know you, you don't do it in your house, but some, some do that, okay? Um, and the wife said, well, let's go talk to the preacher. And the man said, he told me about this letter, he said, we don't need to. He said, we've got the same book the preacher has. What we need to do is open the book and see what it says and do what it says. Amen. That's all you got to do. Go to the book. Go to the book. So always follow what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. won't take the time to turn there. But it talks about being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine that comes your way. Some Christians are so confused, they wouldn't know the truth if you didn't square between the face because they've been listening to everything in the world. They've been watching Christian TV too much. That nut out there in Arizona, Stephen uh, Anderson. How many ever heard of him? Thank God, only a few of you. You don't have nothing to do with it. He's an independent King James Baptist, but he's a nut. He's crazy. And he's got some false ideas, real false ideas. And he's so bent on those ideas, he professionally puts out DVDs. I've got several of his DVDs that he sent me. I never asked for any. I've never bought any. Uh, DVDs denouncing Israel. We are now Israel. No, we're not. That's British Israelism. That's a cult. Uh, and denouncing Israel. And, uh, uh, and the, the Christians are going to go through the tribulation. I'm not going. You can if you want to. I'm leaving here before it starts. Okay. And you can stay behind if you want to. Anybody can have this church. Once the, once the rapture takes place, I'll be gone. Uh, he's teaching stuff like independent King James Baptist. You guys are not. He's a coot. But I'll tell you what. His influence is growing. First time I ran into him has been about 10, 12 years ago, but now I hardly go preach anywhere. So I says, you ever, you ever heard of this guy, Stephen Anderson? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. His interest is growing because he sends these DVDs out all over the country. He sends them to preachers all over, all over the country. And, and he's crazy. you got to be careful, young people, who you listen to. Hey. When my wife and I first got saved, we were listening on the radio to Gar Ted Armstrong. Anybody ever know who I'm talking about? Gar Ted Armstrong. A, a, a cop, man. The Worldwide Church of Tomorrow, started by his daddy, Herbert W. Armstrong. He was a nut, a cop. But he's suave. And it sounded good until he started, we started hearing him say things like Jesus had owned three homes. Well, then how come he didn't have where to lay his head? <laughs> and two wives, one of those Mary Magdalene. And I thought, this guy's a nut. He's crazy. <laughs> And then trying to push uh, worship on Saturday, on the Saturday instead of Sunday, all that kind of stuff. But there's there's so much stuff out there that if you go listen to all that business, you're going to get confused. You're going to get real confused. There's uh, there's all kind of uh, people on Christian. Are you listen to what is what is that over there in Pensacola? W whatever, uh, PCS. Okay, they got some nuts on there too. Amen. That's all I'm saying. Real good. Uh, somebody was talking to me recently about uh, he had all the all the writings of uh, who is it? The guy that takes you through the Bible on the radio. Jay Vernon McGee. Vernon McGee. Jay Vernon McGee. Yeah, Jay Vernon McGee had all his books. Well, that's wonderful. Okay, McGee had a few things to say, but his uh, his uh, ideas on baptism were incorrect. He's a Presbyterian. Okay. So you got to check people out. I had somebody give me a tape one time uh, from uh, that guy in Atlanta, that Baptist preacher. Yeah. Everybody tells me I look like him. God forbid. They said, uh, yeah, Charles Stanley, Charles Stanley. And said, boy, this is a good message. And he used the King James Bible. First five minutes, he's going from the NASB. What happened? How come that guy that gave me a tape didn't know? He's a member of the church. How come he didn't know that? Listen too much. Listen to many people. Amen. Check them out. Check them out. Have I ever told you to check me out what I preach? Amen. Why? Because I'm a man. I can make mistakes just like anybody else. Check it out by the final authority, young people. It's got to be that book. Amen. It's got to be the book. Follow what the Bible says. First Peter 
3.15 says, um, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Where are you going to get that answer from? Proverbs says you get it out of the book. You have wherewith to answer him that asketh thee. So that Bible's got to be important to you, young people. Let me, let me encourage you, young adults and teenagers, read your Bible every day. Well, mom and Dad don't do that. I didn't, I'm not talking about Mom and Dad. Don't I? You. Read your Bible every day. When you run into things you don't understand, get some counsel on it, okay? You might not be mature enough to understand some things just yet. Now ask your dad about it. Ask your mom about it. Ask your Sunday school teacher, your preacher about it. Amen. But study that Bible for yourself. Don't be like the average church member today. Not to be spoon-fed everything from the Word of God. You talk to average, uh, independent, uh, not independent, average uh, Southern Baptist church member, they don't know anything about the Word of God. Nothing. Why well, are they sitting there hearing some social gospel when they go to church and things like that? And what are they going to know? Just like those Catholics, some of our members went to hear the other day. <laughs> 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 Study the Bible for yourself. Once you can learn to read. And by the way, when they talk about the new versions being easier to read. Uh, I think the NIV is on the 11th grade level and so on, but this book is 3rd to 6th grade level. Any kid in grammar school ought to be able to read his Bible. Yeah. I can't pronounce it in big name. Well, that ain't no big deal. Most adults can't either. That's not the point. Just read it. The Lord said to this guy, and go <laughs> read what it says. Amen. Let that be your final authority. Thus saith the Lord. One other thing, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. Like I said, I'm aiming this at young adults and teenagers, but it will apply to any of us. No matter how long we've been saved. Colossians chapter 1, principle number 7. Don't ever leave God out of your life. Amen. Not for five minutes. Don't leave God out of your life. Colossians 1 verse 18. And he, Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He's the head of the church. Who is the beginning? Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he, Jesus, might have the preeminence. He's got to have the first place in the life. He's got to have the preeminence in your life. Don't ever leave him out. When you're facing a decision, talk to the Lord about it. Lord, what would that have me to do? You'll find that question in the Bible. And so don't leave him out of any decision. As you, as you grow, you'll be facing things in life, you, especially you people still growing up in, in your daddy's home and all that kind of stuff. You're going to face, what are you going to do? Or, or, you know, what kind of job? What kind of career? Should you go to college? Should you, uh, who are you going to marry? Where are you going to live? All kind, you're going to face all kinds of decisions. But learn early on to talk to God about it. Don't leave him out of your life. Lord, what would you have me to do? And learn to wait on the Lord. And uh, you'll be you'll be eons ahead of most of your parents in here. Amen. Those that did grow up in church, you'll be way ahead of me. Put, put the Lord first in your life. How could I put the Lord first in, in my life as a young person? I didn't even know him. Know nothing about him. Couldn't do it. But you kids have an advantage. And you young adults, you have an advantage. Over some of us. So uh, don't leave the Lord out of your life. Talk to Him. Pray often. Spend time with Him. Let Him become real to you. Remember, Amen. we were talking about David this morning as a young teenager and writing those songs about the Lord and all that kind of stuff. He's engrossed with God as a young person. And you need to be too. Just some principles to live by as you grow up. And even after you're growing, growing in the things of the Lord. Amen. Should I give an invitation? I don't know. You kids, I told you all what, what you need to do. Just do it, okay? Just do it. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to pray about it. We'll go ahead and pray about it. Amen. Talk to the Lord. Spend time with Him. Jesus talks about a prayer closet, right? Well, hey, young people, you can have your own prayer closet. You don't have to be grown. You don't have to be have a fan and all that stuff before we start serving God. You can do it while you're young. Amen. You'd be surprised. You read some testimonies of some of the saints 
what they did while they were growing up to the Lord. Got involved in His work already. And some of you kids do. Some of you young people do. Some of you young adults do. Praise the Lord for that. Don't ever leave Jesus out of your life. He will live to regret it if you do. He is everything, and His Word is the final authority. Okay, let's stand and be dismissed before we pray.